When the British anthology comic 2000 AD debuted in 1977, the UK was mired in rampant inflation in a cost of living crisis and increasing class tension. One growing concern for the UK's poor and marginalised was the increasing militarisation of the police. 1977 marked the first year that British police used riot shields on domestic soil. It's also the same year that New Scientist magazine published this article linking the use of riot shields with the rise of civilian injury. Because it turns out, coppers immediately started using these things to bash people over the head. As the 1970s closed out, Judge Dredd's writers and artists started to take more direct influence from the news and from current affairs. Dredd's writers and artists used the comic as a vehicle to discuss very real things like police brutality at a time when conservative voices in Britain's media were calling for a crackdown on crime. The subject of over-policing had been the inspiration for a lot of early Judge Dredd stories, originally more for laughs, but as the years rolled on, this became less of a joke and more of an integral part of the Judge Dredd mythos. And in 1980, Judge Dredd met some villainous coppers who were so evil, they made him look like Sergeant Slipper by comparison. This, of course, is the year that Judge Dredd met the Dark Judges. From Dredd's first appearance in Prog 2 of 2000 AD, he was shown to be busting all kinds of futuristic criminals. Robo-racists, solar snipers, bent judges. But when you consider that by the end of every story, the perp was either dead or sent off planet or put in the ISO cubes for the rest of their lives, there never really was an opportunity for Dredd to pick up a persistent villain of his own. And how would that even work? Like... What kind of foil can you create for the lawman of tomorrow? Whenever it looks like some perp has got the other hand, we always find out that Dredd was one step ahead of them the whole time. So rather than fighting against that and creating a villain who was opposed to Dredd's central ideology, you know, a Joker to his Batman, a Moriarty to his Sherlock Holmes, instead, John Wagner continued as far down Dredd's ideological pipeline as he could. A judge whose values and whose use of force actually lean in the same direction as Dredd's, but they go way beyond the logical endpoint into insane, crazy new levels. Judge Death first appeared in Prog 149 in January 1980. He was written by John Wagner and drawn by Brian Bolland. Wagner co-created Judge Dredd, and he wrote a ton of all those big, iconic Judge Dredd stories. But outside of Dredd, outside of British comics, he's probably best known to American audiences as the guy who wrote History of Violence, that comic that got the film with Viggo Mortensen in it. American viewers are probably more likely to have heard of Brian Bolland. Undoubtedly, he is one of the all-time great exports of the British comics scene. And I know that you will know him best for Camelot 3000, but I do believe he did draw a Batman story once. There's probably a good chunk of people whose perception of dread is formed by a few really iconic Bolland illustrations. Judge Death is introduced as this spooky, ghostly murderer who's jaunting about in this macabre spin on the judge's uniform, giving real supernatural slasher vibes but predating, well, all of them actually. Within the first few pages, the judges turn up and blast him away, but he doesn't die. His disembodied spirit rises from his corpse, chats some breeze and then pisses off. You have delayed me, but that is all. This city is evil, but I will cleanse it. The debut of Judge Death also happens to be the debut of side division psychic super babe Judge Anderson. 
It's Anderson who figures out that Judge Death is actually an undead monster from a parallel dimension. The judges on Death's world created stricter and stricter laws to clamp down on crime, until they realised that all crime is committed by the living, and therefore the root cause of all crime is life. And so if the crime is life, then it would follow that the punishment is death. Judge Death and his judges had wiped out all life on their own world, and so they then tried to find ways to spread their version of justice to other worlds and other universes. Anderson is able to defeat Judge Death by holding his spirit form inside her head and then encouraging Dread to mummify her in the miracle plastic boing. It is pretty funny because Judge Death is shown to be this like immaterial ghost who can phase through anything, but he can also be trapped inside of plastic. On the face of it, this isn't that monumental a comic. It's three progs long, it ends with the villain locked away forever. It doesn't actually feel like it stands out that much from any other late 70s or early 80s dread comic. Certainly, I don't think Wagner and Bolland had realised that they had created probably the most iconic villain in all of British comics. Bolland's design is so iconic. I mean, his clean pen work here is just firing on all cylinders, doing so much heavy lifting. Judge Death is a, a monstrous reimagining of Judge Dredd. Taking more than a little inspiration from Kevin O'Neill's Torquemada, Judge Death is festooned with skulls and bones and dead animal bits. I love his helmet design more than anything. The front of it is designed to look like a portcullis, which on the face of it feels like something that you have on the front of a castle to stop people getting in. But in fact, portcullises were actually used at either end of a corridor to trap people so that you could then kill them. I don't know if this is a coincidence, but it's also the symbol of UK Parliament and it's the logo for customs and border control all across the Commonwealth. Is Bolland using the portcullis as a symbol for borderless policing? I don't know. It certainly wasn't in the script and he's never mentioned this in interviews, but I don't really think things like this happen by coincidence. It's obvious to say that death is a dark mirror to dread. You know, he is um, a Captain Black or a, a Nemesis Prime or a Venom. You know, he is what dread would look like if whatever thin veneer of morality that holds him back from being a genuine monster was one day lifted. A copper with all of the power and none of the accountability. I mean, this is interesting in itself because dread is essentially a symbol of what happens when coppers have lots of power and not very much accountability. In the few years on the run up to this book, Little Towers, Blair Peach, William Stratton, James Kelly, these were victims of police brutality whose murders were never justified. In nearly every case, the police who killed these people never faced justice. Wagner is talking to the terrifying reality that a policeman can just kill you if they want to, and the establishment can just justify it after the fact. Judge Death is quite literally over-policing made carnet. All nuance is flattened out into only two binary realities. There is only one crime and there is only one punishment. He is the analogy of Judge Dredd turned up to a thousand to make sure that those in the back can actually hear it because they didn't realise it was a parody the first time around. It's another layer of abstraction, I'll give you that, but this is essentially the reason why I can never view Judge Dredd as a hero. Now sure, Judge Death is like the complete end point of the path that Judge Dredd is on, and it'll be a long time before he ever, if he ever reaches that extremity. But he's on his way. Wagner established in that first story that Judge Death can't die, so any real solution is always going to be finite. It took a year and a half, 
but eventually it happened. Judge Death Lives was written by Alan Grant and John Wagner, again drawn by Brian Bolland. The story takes place between Progs 224 and 228, and it debuted in August 1981. After Death's defeat at the hands of a can of Boingo spray, this div is poking around in the museum where Anderson's body is on display. Turns out he's been coerced into releasing Judge Death by this cabal of dark judges who have come to Earth to free their boss, I guess. The comic itself is a bloodbath. The dark judges seal off a whole hab block with some kind of weird force field and then go from floor to floor indiscriminately just killing everybody they find. All 70,000 inhabitants of Billy Carter block are guilty of the crime of life and judgment must be carried out. We get pages upon pages of the dark judges just absolutely tearing through people. Those who manage to escape the building are then being burned to death against the force field, even being crushed against it by people rushing to get out from behind them. There's this great moment when Anderson figures out how to get through the force field, so she phases her and dread through it, and then death's like, Anderson. After some heavy and bitter losses, the judges of Mega City 1 do eventually start to gain the upper hand. And eventually the Dark Judges then flee back to their own dimension, which we now learn is called Dead World. But Dread isn't happy to call that a win. There are already thousands of people dead in Mega City 1, and as we've learned about Dread, he's not really the kind of person who lets these things go. He decides that he needs to chase the Dark Judges back to their own dimension before they have a chance to, like, reconsolidate and launch another attack. Dead World, as it's called, is exactly that. Everything is dead here. There are just piles of bones as far as the eye can see. As soon as they arrive, Anderson is like assaulted by all the billions of restless souls of all the people that were murdered over the years. And in the final conflict, it is in fact these dead souls that allow Anderson to finish the fight. With her forming a conduit for all of their anger, she is able to finally defeat the Dark Judges. I think it's pretty obvious that Wagner and Bolland here are riffing off of the established Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, but I'm going to get a bit esoteric here. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse are like these allegorical forces for, you know, huge concepts that were outside of the control of normal people, war and famine and so on. But these are like the esoteric forces that were forming people's destinies when the Bible was written in like the first century in Rome. And I think that the Dark Judges are essentially the same thing, but they're recontextualized as modern horrors. Wagner and Bolland are given form here to the same esoteric forces controlling the lives of proles, but recontextualized for inner city urban life, the, 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 the forces controlling the lives of 20th century proles. The hab blocks of Mega City 1 were partly inspired by all these blocks of flats that we saw springing up in England after World War II, which, by the 70s and 80s, were looking pretty dystopian already. Judge Fire is an easy one. One fear which anybody living in a, in a tower block has ever had to deal with is fire. Fire safety standards for low-income housing and public facilities has historically been pretty terrible. I mean, they still are. But domestic deaths by fire were like five times higher 40 years ago than they are today. Maybe Wagner was inspired by the Summerland Leisure Centre fire of 1973. Or maybe he was inspired by the profusion of inner city fires in cities like Glasgow or New York during the 1970s. Whichever it was, there is no denying that fire is a deadly enemy to people who are forced into living in close proximity. And so then it's no surprise that it's presented here as this 
abstract, deadly force outside of normal people's control. Personified as some sort of zombie horse, Judge Mortis's powers are rot and decay. Now, to my mind, that conjures up the images of urban decay. This is a phrase that was being used more and more throughout the 1970s and 80s to describe these post-industrial towns that were just falling into rot without government support. These landscapes of crumbling concrete and rusted rebar, homes filled with black mould and fungus. These flats that I've been talking about, these estates, they, they were thrown up quick. They were made out of prefab parts and sometimes these parts didn't even fit together properly. England is a wet country. Moisture would just soak into these buildings and it would never quite dry. Mushrooms growing on the walls was quite a commonly used visual gag in British comics when I was growing up to indicate that people were poor. Two decades of economic pressure and poor housing inspection saw a lot of these housing blocks in the UK falling into dangerous disrepair. The high town flats in Wrexham were so well known for their poor construction and poor upkeep. The council actually erected nets around the buildings to catch the chunks of concrete as they fell off. The health risks associated with your house rotting inside and out feels very fitting for a horseman of the urban apocalypse. Inside Judge Fear's helmet is a face so terrifying it can kill you by showing you your worst possible fears. Now this might actually throw back to the very early Judge Dredd stories where anybody who ever saw Judge Dredd's true face was utterly horrified and usually later died. But I feel like the fact that the mask has this sort of um, cemetery gates kind of look or like maybe the gates of Arkham or even the gates of like a, a swanky gated community, I think there is something interesting coded into that. Fear is the most interesting judge to me. Uh, everybody feels fear. In fact, fear's quite good. It motivates you into action. But I don't think fear's true power is in his spooky face. I think it lies in other elements of Bolland's design. His robes of office have these big pauldrons that look like bear traps. Bear traps also make up the tools of his trade, along with chains and padlocks. I'm saying that if the Dark Judges have been specifically retooled here to represent the horrors the establishment can visit on the working class, then I think fear is the inescapable fact of being locked into this horror with no means of escape. I'm not sure how you would or even if you could design a Judge Poverty, but if you did, this would be it. I'm thinking back now to my earlier thoughts about Judge Death's portcullis mask and that idea of being trapped, being unable to escape the judgment of these huge forces that you can never have any control over. And when the book shows us these sequences of all these people locked into these buildings, getting killed, getting crushed, panicking, climbing over each other to get out of this crazy chaotic nightmare situation it's that feeling of being trapped that comes through we had established early on that the dark judges are in fact undead you cannot kill what does not live etc etc uh, and that's useful if you want a recurring villain as well right and the truth is they will always be relevant as long as we still have those same injustices and inequalities that inspired their creation. And in May 1985, we saw them return. Four Dark Judges was written by John Wagner and Alan Grant, this time with art by Brett Ewins, Cliff Robinson and Robin Smith. This isn't a Judge Dredd strip. In fact, this is the first standalone strip starring Judge Anderson. And told over nine progs, it is longer than the previous two stories added together. Anderson is still haunted by visions of Judge Death and of Deadworld. And I want to say here, I really like how Ewins 
portrays a lot of vulnerability when he's drawing Anderson. I don't remember if it was Alan Grant or John Wagner, but one of them said it was important to them that Anderson was a girl, that she wasn't just a bloke with tits. Anderson is a badass. She is tough as nails, but she is still a woman. And I like how Ewan shores that up by showing that she is soft and vulnerable at the same time as being strong. I will admit it is a little bit male gazy. I'm pretty sure none of the other judges have ever had so much detail rendered into their bum cheeks. But still, it's there and it's good. Anyway, Anderson is convinced that her visions of death's return aren't just dreams. And so she travels back to Deadworld to confirm whether or not the Dark Judges are in fact dead or alive. Or unalive whatever it turns out it's a trap the dark judges bodies may have been destroyed but their souls like hid in the ground or something (laughs) i want to say now i just absolutely love the ghost forms of the dark judges i love the fact that it's just their disembodied heads floating around in these like necroplasm balloons it really stretches the definition of a serious horror story when you've got these sort of goofy (laughs) floating heads flying about It is hilarious, despite the fact that Anderson is in very genuine mortal danger. Anyway, they've tricked her into coming here so that basically they can, like, ride her back to Mega City 1. They end up back in the Big Meg, and it is absolute carnage, as you can no doubt imagine. They're absolutely tearing through crowds of people this time. But Anderson is no fool. She knows that you can't defeat the Dark Judges with physical force. We couldn't fight back with Braun, so we used our brains. I warned you not to use those things. There's this big final showdown between Death and Anderson. They've been orbiting each other now for for years. They've become bitter rivals. And I, I really like this as a big dramatic finale. Really, Death is as much Anderson's villain as he is Dreads. In fact maybe more so but anyway they end up having this big dramatic finale in a supermarket which is just so ludicrous how can you not love it it all ends well of course the status quo is restored Ozzy went on stage and did a great show the comic had only really just entered the era of setting up these longer plays and experimenting with longer term storytelling And these brief, spooky little romps marked the beginning of not just the most iconic villains in Judge Dredd, but arguably the most iconic characters from British comics, full stop. I actually used to dislike Judge Death. I thought that the supernatural element of the Dark Judges underpinned what was otherwise a very grim and gritty urban science fiction story. It just felt really silly to me. And what can I say? I I was a very serious young man. I I didn't really get the vibes, you know? I didn't like Ewoks. I didn't like Doctor Who. Oh yeah, I like Doctor Who now. But like Star Wars, Judge Dredd's world is wacky and fluid enough to be able to tell pretty much any kind of story. And actually, if you're able to integrate the kind of campier, sillier parts of him, along with the much grimmer and darker images of what he represents, there's actually something really special about Judge Death. We established that they can't die, so the Dark Judges would continue to appear as consistent villains both for Dredd and for Anderson. After this, they appeared in Necropolis and Batman Judge Dredd, both of which are future videos, by the way, and they continued being mainstay villains right through into the modern era. They're still around today. If you want to read these stories for yourself, I do not recommend hunting down the original progs. 2000 AD is not a comic that was really intended to last. They've all been collected a bunch of times in this mad, confusing mass of trade paperbacks. And actually, because of the long gaps between the publication of these stories, they're actually spread out over Judge Dredd Complete Case Files, Book 3, Book 5, and Judge Anderson's Sci Files, Book 1. They are, however, all collected in the Judge Death Lives volume of the Hatchet Mega Collection, 
But your best bet is the more recent Rebellion published Essential Judge Dread, Dread vs. Death trade paperback. The Anderson story in that has actually been coloured and it also includes some like really cool, interesting little b-sides and oddities just for more context. For my money, this book is by far the best entry point to read the stories that I've spoken about in this video. If you happen to be interested in the intersection between Judge Dredd comics and the history of real life policing, then I highly recommend Michael Mulch's book, I Am The Law. This is a really good look, not just at Judge Dredd comics, but also the increasing militarization of the police, both here in the UK and in America. This book is super inspirational. It's full of really useful little historical snippets. The bit at the beginning of my video where I spoke about the riot shields, I actually just lifted that wholesale from this book. And I do have a video coming out in the future where I basically just plagiarized an entire chapter of this. Madly recommended. Please go check this out. I'll put links in the description of where you can get it. Thank you so much for watching this all the way to the end. If you like Judge Dredd and British comics, then please check out my previous uploads and subscribe because I've got more coming out in the future. Finally, I'd like to give a huge thanks to the channel supporters. If you'd like to see your name here at the end of the video, then there are links in the description about how you can help support the channel. Keep your eyes peeled as I'm going to be adding new and interesting ways that you can support the channel in the next couple of months. I'll see you in the next video, but until then, keep those vibes tuned to good and I'll see you soon. All right. Ta-da.